Symbols are a powerful thing. In the case of Battletech, they can be more than simple art or a statue, but they can be the war machines that stride through the battlefields of the Inner Sphere. The subject of today's video was the purest symbol of the Alliance of the Federated Sons and the Liran Commonwealth, which would be united into the mighty Federated Commonwealth. Built in both Davian and Steiner space, from multiple manufacturers and parts, the melee-centric mech in question is none other than the famous... Axeman. To understand the origins of the 65-ton heavy mech known as the Axeman, one really needs to understand the history of the state that produced it, which was unique in the history of the setting. The Succession Wars were a violent exercise in hubris, utility, and discord from the first through to the third iteration of the conflicts. No two great houses would manage to cooperate in any meaningful sense for centuries after the collapse of the Star League and House Cameron. Whole worlds would die in the fires of this inhuman struggle for supremacy. Technology would be cast back into the Dark Ages, and only the barest glimmer of a better tomorrow remained after the carnage that was wrought. During the dying days of the Third Succession War, it would be Katrina Steiner, Archon of the Lyran Commonwealth, who would finally wish to see the end to this madness. There were a multitude of reasons for this, but it had become obvious that the wars were horrific, all while not achieving their desired results. And they also served to hinder economic and technological development that would benefit the states that govern the majority of humanity. She would send word to her fellow former Lords of the Star League in 3020, asking for a chance at peace. Each and every House Lord rejected this proposal, with the Free Worlds League's Janos Marek being particularly scathing in his rebuke. But it would be Hans Davian of the Federated Sons who would see the potential to build something more than this and would instead use this invitation as an opportunity to speak more with the Archon. What would follow would be a burgeoning partnership and an agreement. An alliance. What would follow would be a new political force in the Inner Sphere. The cooperation between two great successor states, and in this instance the two most powerful successor states. It would be the union of the innovation, competence, and cunning of the Federated Sons, combining with the overwhelming economic and industrial power of the Leering Commonwealth. With the marriage of Hans Davian and Melissa Steiner, the Federated Commonwealth was born. Ironically, this state would be born with the idea of bringing peace to the Inner Sphere, as brought forward by Katrina Steiner's vision. But the beginning of this union would launch one of the most destructive wars of the 31st century, the Fourth Succession War. This would result in the defeat of the Free Worlds League and Draconis Combine, and the near total destruction of the Capellan Confederation. To add further to this Realm of Peace's plan, now mostly in the hands of Hans Davian, there would be a dedicated assault on the Draconis Combine, attempting to annihilate their rival state, or at the very least bring it to heel, in the War of 3039. A war which the Federated Commonwealth would, in essence, lose. Despite the conflict not having a conclusive end, the truth was the Combine fighting and holding as they did against the overwhelming power of their enemy state is most definitely a victory and was seen as such across the Inner Sphere. The reason all of this is important is it gives context to what the Federated Commonwealth was. And during all of this time, during these wars and invasions, and quite frankly their aggression, more was happening within the borders of the Federated Commonwealth. Industries were being rebuilt. Technological innovations which House Davian could never exploit on their own, or produce at scale, were now being put into operation. New facilities were being built on both sides of their unified border. What was happening within the Federated Commonwealth was quite frankly prosperity. 
something which had been almost non-existent in the Inner Sphere for almost 300 years. Though despite all of this abundance, there were very few brand new mech designs. Prior to the Fourth Succession War, there was a semi-partnered product built by Haus Steiner, using technological and innovative assistance from New Avalon, which was the 45-ton melee mech, the first of its kind, named the Hatchet Man. This battle mech was an original force in the Inner Sphere, and in spite of its shortcomings, it brought a distinct, ironically more barbaric form of warfare between mechs, and one which would never leave after its introduction. This brutish, literal axe-chopping aspect of warfare would spread to every major house with time. But the second machine built in this image was one which was far more sophisticated than its predecessor. That battle mech would be the Axeman. This new bipedal vehicle, however, wouldn't be produced by one company, in one facility either in the Federated Suns or Lyran Commonwealth, operating typically under what would have been a tight supply chain. Instead, to represent the new state the two houses hoped would last into the distant future, the decision was made to source components and fabricate them across multiple worlds, in both halves of the Federated Commonwealth. In 3048, the first of these hatchet-wielding, close-quarters battle mechs walked off the assembly line. The two principal manufacturers of this platform were Johnston Industries and Defiance Industries with it being produced both on New Sirtis and Furlio. Deployed to units in both districts, and from both backgrounds, it was intentionally meant to be a symbol for unity between the member states of the Federated Commonwealth, and it would be tested as the clans plunged into the Inner Sphere in their surprise invasion, ripping through the Draconis Combine, Free Rosselhag Republic, and the Lyran half of the Federated Commonwealth. Due to the nature of its weapons package, it was found that the Hatchet Man performed well against the clan invaders, who avoided and abhorred melee combat, viewing it as primitive and dishonorable. Many clan mech warriors, particularly Jade Falcon ones, would find themselves crushed into gore inside of the shattered ruins of their cockpits from the Axe Man's hefty hatchet. So successful was this, it would even be noted by Comstar, who would implement changes to their Black Knight, the Clan Buster, and a hatchet would be incorporated due to the success demonstrated by the Axeman's various designs. The Axeman, however, would struggle to continue much past the invasion, not due to a lack of popularity, despite some issues that emerged with the design, but simply due to the fact that the Federated Commonwealth would split and enter into a calamitous civil war. Not only did this war strain both states, destroying vital infrastructure and facilities, as well as killing countless millions of innocent people, but it also shattered the supply lines that allowed for the Axeman to be constructed in the first place. After the war, production would be anemic in both states as they attempted to find solutions to their problems, creating alternative variants and attempting to fabricate and source new components in this now broken supply line. It would never rise to the prominence it once had, however, at the height of the Federated Commonwealth, despite it struggling on as a design after the Calamity. In the latest era of warfare, the Ill Clan era, Johnson Industries would attempt to place this mech back in its rightful place with a new variant, with only locally sourced parts. This would be interrupted by a Capellan occupation on their facilities of New Sirtis. But now liberated by Julian Davian, it appears that perhaps the Axeman marches proudly once again. This time, for one of the two houses that gave it life. Built after the discovery of the Helm Memory Core, and by one of the most technologically advanced states in the Inner Sphere, the Axeman benefits from an array of technologies that help it achieve its goals as a platform. The 1N, the first production model of this type, utilizes a standard gyro and internal structure, 
but it does benefit from an innovation first implemented in the Hatchet Man. Namely, the AXM-1N has a feature called Full Head Ejection, which is where the entirety of the mech's head will launch from the mech upon ejection, in an attempt to preserve the life of its pilot, especially in hostile environments. This limits the exposure they may have to the elements, for instance, but otherwise it also prevents the pilot from being injured upon their ejection in the same way, such as by debris, gunfire, or other unseen hazards. For design quirks, the 1N benefits from the protected actuators trait. One of the most controversial elements of the Axeman, at least after the clan invasion, was its inclusion of an Inner Sphere XL engine. More specifically, it is powered by a 7-ton Magna 260 XL fusion engine. This extra light power plant gives it a maximum speed of 64 kilometers per hour, which mostly works for its intended role when used in dense terrain or built up environments. In the tabletop game, this also gives it six movement points overall. This still gives it a chance to operate with normal frontline units of the Inner Sphere, which are typically expected to move at approximately 60 kilometers per hour for battle line formations. This is more than fast enough once it enters a city, especially in conjunction with its ability to leap up to 120 meters, thanks to its Hildco Model 12 jump jets. Where things begin to fall flat for the Axeman is that while it does have armor, close quarter engagements are often necessarily brutal engagements, with great volumes of fire being exchanged between targets, and an XL engine should result in a quick end should one of the Axeman's torsos be knocked out. With ammunition playing a major role in the mech's design, this can quickly result in the end of this would-be close quarters killer. Being unable to afford to invest significantly in heat sinks in order to satisfy its design goals, the AXM-1N benefits enormously with the implementation of double heat sinks. While it doesn't contribute any of its precious tonnage to its heat sink pool, it does still have 20 cooling due to it having a base of 10 double heat sinks. While this still means it can't fire all of its weapons on board reliably, the Axeman can definitely still fire its primary systems together, or fire one of its main guns, followed by its secondary weapons. And this is to say nothing of its non-heat generating melee capabilities. In order to justify its XL engine, limited heatsink investment, as well as its moderate but not heavy protection, the Axeman must surely invest significantly in weapons to get around these potential hurdles. This is absolutely the case, with the Axeman being fantastically armed for an Inner Sphere Heavy Mech from the 65 ton weight bracket. First, installed in its right and center torso is its true primary weapon, a system more powerful than anything else on board, and arguably more powerful than any other weapon at the time of its deployment, at least among the Inner Sphere, namely its Luxor Devastator 20 autocannon. The power of this weapon in the Inner Sphere is both legendary and terrifying, and while surpassed by lighter and more deadly clan equivalents, it is still nonetheless extraordinarily dangerous, even to the clans themselves. A single hit from this cannon forces a target to make tests just to remain standing, or can blast the head clean off a target. This gun shreds through plating and blasts through internal structures. Another of its main weapons is mounted in the left arm, and is its accurate and dangerous Satel Precision Line Large Pulse Laser. This gives the Axeman the ability to lay fire into targets at around the same range as its other weapons, but in a more accurate capacity and for good concentrations of damage. Finally, as far as its range systems go, it is backed up with three Intech medium lasers, all mounted on the right arm. These cannot be used once it gets in too close, however, as its right arm will be busy doing something else. Namely, swinging the weapon that it is named for. Because within its right arm resides a five-ton hatchet. 
This weapon is exceptional because it has the power to down and destroy an enemy mech with a single swing, doing a devastating 13 damage, enough to take the head off of any mech, inner sphere, or clan alike. It also has a bonus to hit with it as well. Ideally, the Axeman will emerge from a concealed position, or use terrain and buildings to mask its approach, before engaging, swinging its terrifying hatchet, while firing its devastating autocannon and large pulse laser. For a 65-ton heavy mech, the Axeman runs in the middle of the pack for armored protection. While this doesn't seem bad at first glance, and it's not, it's important to remember the vulnerabilities that are purchased along with the expensive XL engine it has. The Axeman cannot become a quote, zombie, as they are affectionately called by the Battletech community, as it cannot afford to lose either of its side torsos. To prevent such a calamity from happening, the 1N has 10 tons of inner sphere ferrofibrous plating, produced by Kalon Industries. This results in 179 points of armor in the tabletop game. Each of its side torsos possesses 21 points of exterior plating, and 15 points of internal structure. This is enough to suffer through moderate damage before it starts to become a real problem for the mech, especially if the left torso is the target of the damage, because this is where its explosive materials are contained. But the real problem is, is if the Axeman is forced into the open, away from significant terrain features or built-up areas, it may find itself rapidly degraded and destroyed, especially by its most common adversaries at the time of its production, more specifically, the warriors of Clan Jade Falcon. Close quarters themselves are also unforgiving, to be clear, just because the Axeman makes it to its ideal range, or melee does not mean that it will survive an engagement against a heavily armed adversary, especially if they have powerful close-range systems to rely on. The Axeman is an interesting idea in its original form, designed to fight the Draconis Combine, Free Worlds League, and Compelling Confederation in a very different style of warfare. It would find itself instead pitted against mostly Clan Jade Falcon, and then later the ill-fated Clan Steel Viper. When provoked at range, in a sparse battlefield, the Axeman's true weakness shows through. Though armored, it is not enough to avoid destruction from a concentrated, powerful series of attacks before it can close to its ideal range of engagement. Its XL engine will prove to be the real problem, unless it can dictate the battle on its own terms. In a city, forest, heavily hilled area, or really any heavily covered area, the Axeman can reveal itself as a devil to pounce on its opponents and cleave them apart, while its autocannon thunders and their adversaries simply vanish in the wake of its wrath. With two head clipping weapons at point blank range, fighting may end before it even escalates past only a few moments of the struggle. But even at this range, should it face down a clan heavy equipped with a heavy battery of weapons, its armor and XL engine may not be able to survive the wrath of its clan peers, and later, its more advanced inner sphere counterparts. The Axeman 1N is a complicated design. It is by no means a generalist, but it has a role in a well-crafted force, especially in the era of warfare that it emerged from. Despite its flaws, many, many clan warriors met an ugly, grisly end either blown to pieces as their cockpit was annihilated by its relatively primitive Devastator autocannon, or crudely splattered and crushed in their cockpit, as its enormous axe was swung into their battle mech's heads. Despite its limited production era, there are several variants of the Axeman, though they are not endless seemingly in number as compared to the more venerable designs or ones which were produced in larger numbers for longer from the same period. In this video, I will be covering two of them. Perhaps one of the most well-known variants of the Axeman, this model, the 2N, was built at the same time as the 1N, though was a less common variation of it. 
focusing on ranged fire rather than being a close quarters combatant. The biggest change for this battle mech is largely just how it prioritizes its primary armament. Whereas the 1N equips the design with an AC-20 autocannon as its main damage system, the 2N, which otherwise stays mostly the same, replaces this system and instead invests in twin Coventry Starfire LRM-15 racks, with two tons of ammunition in totality. This gives it a similar long-range firepower output as a trebuchet support mech, or catapult. While its ammunition is limited, this is likely assuming that the Axeman is either still going to attempt to close ranks with the enemy, or that it is acting as a bodyguard for long-range support mechs while it assists in that role. With its axe still being available for melee fighting, as well as its medium lasers and large pulse laser, it can still bring a vicious assault on battle mechs foolish enough to assume that the Axeman was only an AC-20 delivery system. The 2N overall is a more versatile platform. In short, just simply because it can defend itself at range, and more often than not is not placed at the forefront of battles as a close range mech. Because of this, it can operate in the open or in sparse terrain conditions more actively, though it can still be knocked out from a single torso being lost. It not only is more balanced, it is frankly likely better at handling clan opposition as well, at least in more situations than its ambush and close quarters reliant sibling. During the Dark Age, Johnson Industries would gain access to a myriad number of technologies in this new age of warfare. Austavian, much like how Steiner, had made immense leaps forwards in terms of their technological capabilities, and this is embodied in this new design. The AXM-5N is the result, and is the deadliest Axeman to date. Funnily enough, its production was hindered by the fall of New Sirtis, to the Capellan Confederation. Some feared this design would even fall into the hands of the Confederation, but the supply chain simply weren't there for them to produce them for themselves in any meaningful numbers. With the restoration of New Sirtis to the Federated Sons, these have once more begun to walk out of the production facilities. First, it has the original XL engine on board, as well as the same heatsink total, jump jets, and internal structure. What changes is almost everything else. First, it does attempt to address one of the key problems of the Axeman, survivability. By introducing light ferrofibrous instead of its traditional ferrofibrous, but increasing the volume of armor to 12 tons, giving it 203 points of armor which is around a 10% increase in this protection. Next, it adds a Guardian ECM suite to enhance survivability yet furthermore. Its explosive materials are then hidden behind a Case 2, meaning that should it suffer a catastrophic explosion, the Case 2 might just save the mech and allow it to continue to operate or escape. This is a dramatic increase overall in its ability to function for longer, and survive for longer, with all of these factors culminating together. Next, it uses triple strength myomer in the mech, potentially increasing its already dangerous close range fighting ability yet more with this very dangerous technology. When it comes to weapons though, outside of the hatchet, the 5M goes through a radical transformation in its abilities. First, its AC-20 is replaced with the terrifying clan-quality Hyper Assault Goss-20 weapon system. These Goss-centric devices are some of the most feared in the setting, and with it in the very lethal hands of the Axeman, it is a danger at any range. If this weren't enough, it also comes with another piece of clan technology, the extraordinarily dangerous clan ERPPC, a technology Davian has perfected. This particular weapon has an extreme range, can knock the head off almost any mech in the game, and has the power to otherwise strip armor off locations, making it a great companion for the Hag-20, which sends scatter damage down the range instead. The final piece of this deadly puzzle 
are three Inner Sphere ER medium lasers, still mounted in the right arm. While this version of the Axeman does run hot, it's meant to, in order to activate its triple strength myomer, which works in tandem with its still very present hatchet. For a new generation of warfare, the 5N is a new generation of Axeman. It is literally stronger once it engages in melee, and is far more capable at every range of battle, including at long distances, meaning it can fight on any kind of terrain, and is further enhanced by dramatic increases in survivability, despite still having its original Inner Sphere XL engine. It really should have been called the Headsman, because this latest build, with the latest technology, is now striding forward for the Federated Suns, and is a truly dangerous and devastating machine to see. The Axeman's history is a vast one. It starts as an icon of unity between two houses trying to become one. It falls from grace, descending into obscurity mostly for decades, before one of its wayward parents would truly bring it back from the brink of extinction. That parent was the Federated Sons, and the Axeman would return in the form of the 5N, one of the most capable, technologically advanced battle mechs seen to date from the Inner Sphere. The Axeman took the logical progress made in the realm of melee mechs by the Hatchetman and improved upon it. Simply put, it is a Hatchetman in the baseline configuration in many ways, simply scaled up, and improved upon as a result. The extra weight it has on board makes its hatchet become a true death sentence for enemy mech warriors should it strike the head. To add to this, its autocannon is heavier, as is its defensive plating. It's just the next step in what this machine is and should be. From here, other designs would follow, from the night sky to the berserker, and many more, especially after the invention of the mech sword a weapon which the Draconis Combine would gravitate towards. While the dream and vision of the Federated Commonwealth may now be dead, the symbol it created in the Axeman, despite its hurdles and production problems, now lives on in both states. Perhaps as a sad reminder of what was, and what will never be again, Hans Davian, Katrina Steiner, and Militia Steiner wanted to build a state which would outlast them. It did not make it much past their deaths, but they did make a battle mech that did. Which is perhaps the saddest and most ironic thing of all. Katrina Steiner truly wanted peace. And the only thing that came from that and her ideas was more war. And the means of making more war. Thank you for joining me here today. If you enjoyed this video, please hit the like button and consider subscribing to the channel. I do updates very frequently, and you'll be happy with the content, I think. Also, a huge thank you to all the YouTube members for this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel, and I can't thank you enough. Because this content is only possible because of viewers like you. With that, I will see all of you in the comment section below.